I'm happy to be here this morning for this a fine gathering of uh, people, and especially for the young people, as I understand that this uh, service this morning is dedicated to the young people of uh, Shreveport. And it's a very uh, fine time in my life and a highlight, or I call it a red letter, to get to address the boys and girls that will will be tomorrow if there is a tomorrow. That's right. So we're happy for this. How many different denominations is represented here this morning in this little group of people? I'd say Methodists, hold up your hands. I just heard him say from the denomination. All right. Baptists, hold up your hands. Fine. Presbyterian. Just look, Lutheran. Pentecostals. And, and uh, oh, Nazarenes. Pilgrim Holiness. Any other denomination I haven't mentioned, raise up your hand. wonder if there's the Catholics in here. Let's see them raise up their hands. Yeah. See, would there happen to be an Orthodox Jew? Let's see your hand. All right, sir. Sometimes, I believe you're not long ago, the last meeting here, we had one of the rabbis here in the meeting from the Jewish Orthodox, which is the really the mother of all this. See, she brought forth the child, the... Orthodox Church uh, brought forth the Christian Church. Out of, of Judaism come Christianity. And so we are very happy to see you represented here this morning of your church and your stand. And I, I certainly believe this, that, that God, if he should come today, he would, he would not ask that question. If we were all going in this morning, he would just... Uh, Take those who are ready to go. Years ago, I used to ranch, and uh, I was out there a few months ago again, stood right up at the gate with some of the brethren I see sitting here this morning, Brother Welch Evans, Brother Banks Woods from my church in Jeffersonville, and we passed through this gap where I've talked about so much. And I sat there many mornings when he was driving the cattle up off of the, the, uh, the association the, was driving their cattle into the forest. The Repital Forest, the Troublesome River Hereford Association grazes uh, the forest on this side of the Troublesome River, which is called the East Fork. And then there's a West Fork Troublesome, and then the Upper Troublesome River grazes that side. And now, if your ranch can produce, I think it's two bales of hay now, a year, you can put a cow in for each two bales of hay. And, of course, the Chamber of Commerce has your brand and how many cattle you're... Your, uh, your brand takes care of, or your ranch. And the ranger has to stand there to count these cattle as they go in. And then he's supposed to check them over, what brands goes in. And nothing can go in there except a genuine thoroughbred Hereford, because it's a Hereford Association. Nothing but a Hereford, registered Hereford, because... The, the, the bulls and so many bulls to so many cows and so forth. It has to be that way because it keeps the pedigree of the cattle right. And it must be a registered Hereford to go in there. And, you know, I, I watched the ranger as he would count the cattle as they went in, checking. He never one time as I ever seen him yet look at a brand or examine a brand. There was many brands going in, such as the, the Grimes is there, the Diamond Bar, Ours is a turkey track, and then the tripod, and a different, a different brands that went in on that forest. He never noticed what brand they had, but he searched every ear to be sure the blood tag was there. Nothing but a third bred Hereford could go in. And as I've sat there many times, I thought, that's the way it'll be at the judgment. He will never look at our brand, whether we're Presbyterian, Methodist, Baptist, or whatever we are, a Pentecostal, but he'll watch for the blood tag, the token. Amen. That's what will take us in because nothing can come into glory without it's under the blood, a blood tag. That we have accepted what God did for us in Christ. See, there's, there's nothing that we can do for ourselves. We're a total failure, no way at all. When man sinned, he crossed a chasm between him and God and left his no, no way back at all. But God, rich in mercy, accepted a substitute. And that substitute today for us is Jesus Christ. Only that alone will God recognize the blood of His Son when it comes to that time. Now, 
We're having a great time over to the Life Tabernacle. We had a glorious time last evening to see the Holy Spirit move among us, and we're all looking for that. Every man is looking to see where he come from, and what's he doing here, and where is he going after this? And there, we've had many fine books written. I just read some fine books in my life of man's philosophy and things. But although as good as them books may be, there's only one book that can tell you where you come from, what you are, and where you're going. And that's this book, the Bible. And the Word is God. Now, we believe in that book, and that's what we want to stand for in this day. And it's promises in there that we'd be, we'd be made known who we are, where we come from, and where we're going. I was reading an article not long ago in the um, Anderson Movement of the Church of God, a historian writing. I believe it was in, I don't remember exactly now what age it was. It was uh, several hundred years after the death of Christ. Uh, a missionary had come to England, which was then called Angel Land. And he was trying to convert the king of England to uh, Christianity. And they were sitting by a large far place, and the lights uh, of the far was lighting up the, uh, the patio, as we call it today, and the saint was trying to convert the king to Christianity, and a little sparrow flew in to the light, circled around through the light, and went out into the darkness again. And I believe that all happenings are to the glory of God. I believe that he promised us that he'd make everything work together for good to them that loved him. And the saint asked the question, where did he come from? And where did he go to? He came from the unknown and returned back in the same way. And the saint said, this Bible holds a question like that for us. Where we come in from the unknown and go back to the unknown. And the next morning, the king, after studying about it through the night, that the man was right, he and his household was baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of their sins the next morning, which is about three or four hundred years or more after the death of the last apostle. Now, I think this happening this morning of us coming together is just not merely to come here to eat breakfast, though we, we appreciate that. I didn't come because I was tired and I didn't get up just at the time. I was too late. But I think this happening is for the glory of God and for the kingdom of God. Now, let us at this time read the text this morning. I'll read the scripture from the Bible that the Lord seems to put up on my heart. Uh, for the young and old together, especially for the young people of Shreveport who this meeting is dedicated to. Let us read from Isaiah, the sixth chapter, if you will, beginning with the first verse. In the year that King Isaiah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto the other and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone. Because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this has touched thy lips. Thine iniquity is taken away. Thy sins are purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and whom will go for us? 
Then said I, here am I, send me. I want to take a subject from that this morning called influence. You know, as we might not want to believe this, but everything that we do, we are influencing someone else. Uh, many times preach funerals, and I never try to say too much about the person that's passed on because there's no need of saying it. The people, uh, the life the man has, or woman, whatever it might be, has lived would speak louder to the congregation than anything I could say about them. I would never change their opinion. Their life told what they were. And then we never know just what we're doing, uh, what influence, uh, what we're doing is having up on others. The Bible said we are written epistles, read of all man. That is, your life reads so loud to the public until your testimony, if it's contrary to your life, is without any effect. It's what you are inside of you that people read. Not so much what you say, but what you are. See? You can pin something on somebody say, this is that and so forth. But your life being different from what they say, your testimony of your life is louder than the testimony that someone could say something about you. So just keep that on mind that we're bringing influences every day. And the life that you live proves what's on the inside of you. You cannot change that. It reflects. Every person reflects outside what he is inside. And if we take the testimony of being Christians, I think that that is one of the most solemn things that a man or a woman, boy or girl could do. When he takes on the name of Christ, that he's going to be a representative of Christ. You should watch every move you make because somebody's watching you. And in this, it reflects what God has done for you inside of you. Here not long ago, at a, a bridge was to be built down in Australia. And they sent for man from the United States, architects, not architects, but builders and so forth, bridge men, to come down and see if they could build a bridge to span that a strait of water. And uh, well, they couldn't find a man in America that could, uh, could take it. No, they said uh, the sands and so forth, it, it wouldn't stand up. So they had a universal call for bridge builders. None of them would take it. Finally, a fine company of England, they come down and they took the, the contract. After he had tested all the ground, he said he would take the contract and build the bridge. Why? Remember, his reputation now as a worldwide bridge builder rested upon what his work would be in that bridge. No matter what he had done in the past, this job that he said he could do would reflect really what he was. They say that he tested every bolt and every, every piece of metal that went in the bridge, the dirt and so forth beneath and the pressure of the water upon the dirt. And then all the other builders stood around and said, it, uh, it won't stand, it's, it's got to go down. But on the day of the dedication, the man rode himself in the head of the parade because he knew his work was thoroughly tested and it would stand. I think that's a great uh, thing that we could look at in Christian life. There had to be a bridge to span the way for the human race to leave this world someday. And there was no one could do it. An angel, archangel, seraphim, uh, cherubim, nothing could do it. God himself came down in the form of a man and bridged the way and made the way and crossed the bridge first from the grave to glory. And it sure showed the reflection. Every 
every nerve in his body, every thought in his mind, every power that was in him was tested by the enemy, but it stood the test even to death itself when he conquered it. This young boy, uh, Uzziah, that we're speaking of this morning, he was Isaiah's hero. Isaiah, the young prophet in the days of Uzziah, was watching this young fellow. Because Uzziah was a great man, he come from a, a fine background. His father and mother both were strictly staunch believers in God. And they'd raised their boy to serve and to honor God. One of the great lackings of our day today in America and the rest of the world is godly parent to set an influence upon their children. The parents of this day got away from the principles of the Scripture. They went more to the fashions of the world, and the churches did the same thing. In doing that, we let it loose and brought the world into the church, and that's the reason we have this great a day of, if I say it respectfully here before these young people, the reason we got so many hoods and so forth, as they call it, and, uh, and bad characters, too much of it is because of the home life that they were influenced by in their earlier days. I'm still a believer that bring up a child in the way that it should go, and when it gets old, it will not depart from it. Now, Uzziah was a boy who had been brought up in such a parenthood till it influenced him. Look at one of our greatest Americans that I can think of was Abraham Lincoln. He was certainly a, a deserves all the credit that's given him and more. He had a bad start, born in a poor home, had no way of making an education, rode in the sands. We understand that the only two books that he ever owned in his life until he was about 21 years old was the Bible and uh, Pilgrim's Progress. Or it might have been Fox Book of Mortars is one of those books. But you see what that man read, it influenced his life. And that's the same thing it is today. Our markets are, are loaded with vulgar and, and filth to poison the minds of our young children, and then we lay the fault on to them when I think many times it belongs in the, to us. Us Christian people who will not stand up for the thing that's right and have those things lawed off of our shelves and so forth. And then in our homes also that we let loose and permit all these uh, vulgarities and things to come into our home to influence the children. But... Uh, Uzziah had been brought up right, and he was, uh, we understand now in Second Chronicles 26, you can read the story, that at the age of 16, he was made king at the death of his father. And uh, he become king at 16. Having had these godly parents, he started right off with his kingdom to do that which was right. He never catered to popular opinions or politics of that day. He served God. Now, that is a good man to be influenced by. A man that will take his stand for that which is right in the time of when popular opinion is running contrary and politics is running contrary, but a, a man that will set right straight in the road. This new president has just taken over since uh, President Johnson since the assassination of President Kennedy, when he asked the other day that he call for all the clergy throughout the nation for prayer to help him, I admired that in the man. He, he's calling for God to, to help him. I understand that he is a believer and trust in God. So we need men like that. And we find out that Uzziah, in his time, his kingdom spread all the way into Egypt and all the countries round about. To his, it was so great until his kingdom become next to Solomon's kingdom. The glory of the Lord was with him. This give great help to the young prophet Isaiah who was watching this man, this young king, because he was brought to the palace during the time of the reign of this young king. And 
Isaiah being a young prophet at the time and seeing how God blessed him and in, influenced him and gave him the right thing. And we know that all the nations around about paid tribute to him. There was no wars. And it was a great thing, a lesson to Isaiah. And Isaiah found something else in here, that how God will bless them that will be true to his word and his commandments. Uzziah set the example for Isaiah. And what a glorious kingdom it was. And now here we find where that a Christian testimony, no matter how great it's been in the past, it must always continue that way. Amen. Uzziah, when he got to the spot to where he thought he was secure, then he got lifted up in his heart. He got to a place that no one could tell him anything. If that isn't kind of an example of man, too many today, even we find it amongst our, our, our Christian uh, leaders, they work all their life nearly to become some bishop or some great influential man. And as soon as they get to that spot, they get lifted up. We find evangelists in the field that God bless their ministry. And the first thing, you get, become lifted up till you get to a spot that they feel that, that uh, they're secure all around. They're, they're people, they're just, they've reached that place to where they can do anything they want to and get by with it. How many wonder we're thinking of just now? Of great man, great servants who God has used and finally comes to a place that they feel that they know so much about the Word of God they don't even have that time off to pray no more. It's always social visits. Visit somebody. Go out to dinner. And the time that they should be sta standing with God alone, alone and preparing to come out in the sweetness of the Spirit uh, before the congregation, they're out somewhere with some entertainment. You can't serve God and man at the same time. God's servants should be an isolated person to Him only. Uh, if we could only let the people see that. And then they, they get to a place, they make themselves under obligation as they meet the people. They meet the people and there's bound to be a want for this and a want for that. And then the man of God gets his mind all tore up and he's so tore up when he goes to his room, he begins to study. Now, if I don't do this, this man will feel bad about it. And this don't do this, this man will feel bad about it. And then when he walks out to the platform, he hardly knows where he's standing. His mind's all tore up when he ought to have spent that time with God. They're not social leaders. A man of God should be dedicated wholly to the service of God. And we find that that's too, too bad that we have it. Another great thing that we find, because I realize I'm speaking to ministers this morning, and we want... Uh, when we come before a congregation knowing this, that perhaps we'll never meet again like we are this morning. And then the things that you say, God holds you responsible for them. So you must come praying and asking God what to say and then depend on Him when you get in the platform for something that will help the people. We all know of man in the field today, great man. Some of them gets to a spot where after they get their congregation all around them, they feel so secure that they think they can even sin and get by with it. We've been known of ministers taking the wrong road. And many times that's because that they feel secure that, oh, the people let me get by with anything. The people might, my brother, but God won't. You're going to answer to God. You must never try as a minister to try to deceive the ears of your congregation, regardless of how much they can scream or shout or carry on or pat you on the back and say the message is wonderful. You must be a servant to Christ to stay honorable with that word because that word will reflect itself to you and you're going to influence somebody that's watching your life. Young people likewise. Businessman, the same way. The king got lifted up with pride. He thought he was just so secure until uh, God had let him get by with anything. A young teenage boy said not long ago, a Christian, he was doing something. Uh, he was um, admiring a certain rock and roll young fellow that 
belonged to his church, and I was speaking at a Youth for Christ uh, meeting, and this young fellow said, said, you know, uh, I admire so-and-so. I think he's one of the most staunch Christians. And uh, this boy is a rock and roll king. And I said, I think there's only one difference between this young man and Judas Iscariot. That is, Judas got 30 pieces of silver, and this man got fleets of Cadillacs and millions of dollars for selling out to Christ. He said, how could you say such a thing as that, Mr. Branham? How could you do that? I said, because it is the truth. That influence of singing those Christian songs and things like that before the young people and getting out in the world like that throws a greatest stumbling block more than all the bootleg joints and everything else there is in the country. It's a disgrace that that, uh, that would be even be permitted. The church ought to rise up and not even permit those hymns to be sung. But people like that, taking a talent that God give them and influencing with their lives, speaking louder than what their words are. How can people make such plays as these men does and then stand sing hymns and things like that? It's the very height of hypocrisy. And we find out that that goes among Christians, believers. And this young man said, well, I'll tell you what I think about it. He said, I think that, that God loves me so much that he'll let me get by with anything. I said, he never did do that. He never would do it. Even Israel, his nation, even David, a man after his own heart, reaped every grain that he sowed. And you'll do it too. Each one of us will do that. We know that. But he got lifted up so much in his heart. Now I want to speak this word to the full gospel businessman. He got so lifted up in his heart until he thought he could take a minister's place. He tried to become a minister which he wasn't called to be. And I think that's uh, many times it were sometimes man in these uh, ranks uh, and the uh, businessman's groups, they, they get to a spot that God blesses them in their business and makes them prosperous and so forth till they get to a place that they think they ought to preach the gospel also. And that's wrong. Amen. That is wrong. Amen. You should always let a minister do that preaching. Because, uh, as old Roberts once said, it's hard enough to keep the thing clear by ministers, let alone by man who's not called for that office. See? You should have man there that knows and are ordained for the work. This proves it, that uh, he, we find out that this man being a great man, a good man, an honorable man, but he took the, the offering, the censer, and went into the altar of the Lord to burn incense before the Lord, which is only for a dedicated priest to do so. Amen. But he thought being that God loved him so much and, and he had been so good to him that he could go do that anyhow. And the priest ran after him and said, you're not ordained to that office. God forbids that anyone should come in there, only a Levite. It's dedicated to that service. You should never do that. That's the way many times that what I think has got the world today in such a confusion that man go out and try to take those places which you're not ordained to do. It gets to a spot to where they, they try to fulfill this office and they're not called for that place. Now, we find out, though a good man, blessed of God, but if God blesses you, you stay in the category that God has called you in. If it's a housewife, remain a housewife. If it's in a business, remain in that business reflecting God. And whatever God has called you to, let it be that because He wants you to be a real housewife to reflect your influence upon another person that would want to be a good housewife. If you're a good businessman, let your life so be that it will reflect Jesus Christ in your business with honesty and integrity and with things that really mean something because somebody is watching your life. You're influencing somebody. God has to have a real housewife. God has to have a real teenage in school. God has to have a, a, a real minister, a real businessman, somebody that will reflect him. Because there they see in you Christ. No matter what the rest of the world's got to do, that has not one thing to do with you or I. We are responsible to God for our lives and for our experience with Christ. Now, we find out that in his 
uh, trying to take the minister's place and someone telling him he's out of place, telling him he shouldn't do that, he's out of place, he become anger. Angered, he was so angry until his face turned red. See, we must be able to stand and take correction. Some of them won't do it. You can't. Yeah, I've went to meetings and I've sat in the auditoriums and, and you get up and some people come in and sit down just for a few minutes. If you say one word that they don't agree with, gone. See? Flying up. Well, that, you know what happened to Hezekiah uh, doing that, or, or Uzziah rather? God smote him with leprosy. The man died in his leprosy, which is a type of sin. He couldn't stand to be corrected by the Word. Many times a day, it's the same thing. They say, well, my denomination believes this, and I don't care. See, take time to search the Word. God will never judge the world by denomination. He'll judge it by His Word, and His Word is Christ. And Christ is the Word. They're the same. Yesterday, today, and forever. Hebrews 13, 8. But instead of trying to take correction... They fly loose. They can't stand it. They just... Now, that's exactly what Uzziah done, a good man. You say, well, that person was... uh, Uzziah was a good person, too. A fine person, a God-blessed man. But no matter what it was, he must always stay in his place because God gave him the opportunity to influence uh, others by being a righteous king, not a priest. And the Word forbid him to do that. So he went in and was going to offer, and when he was called down, the word was given to him that he wasn't supposed to do that thing, that God had blessed him in his business and whatever it was, but not to try to take this priest's place. He was out of the word. Well, he is going to do it anyhow, no matter what anyone said. Now, isn't that the attitude of too many people today? They won't take correction of the word. And that's the reason we find ourselves wrapped up in a big council of churches here, not knowing where we're going, heading into the world. Tens of thousands of members added every year, and we don't see the hand of God anywhere moving. Dead, formal, just exactly what the Bible said there would be a Lady Osea church age, a lukewarm, spurted from the mouth of God. Christ on the outside trying to get in, and the church inside won't let him in. Sets the picture of the day exactly. Because man doesn't understand that their position comes from the Word, the Word of God. And Uzziah ought to have taken that heed. Now, uh, remember, we call him today a Christian that God had blessed. He wasn't just some ordinary man. He was a man that was blessed by God. But he did not want to stand correction. No matter how much the Word said it was so, he didn't want to understand that because he felt secure enough that God had let him get by with something else. And that's what's the matter with our peoples today around the world. That they think that God will let them get by with something contrary to this Word. He'll never do it. We must come back to correction and stand correction by the Word. And because of his arrogant uh, way he acted, he paid attention to what this minister had to say. He would do what he wanted to do. Just think, now just stop that in your mind a minute. How can a child face a father and mother that's godly, How could a teenager look in the face of a godly old mother with her hair turning gray and say to this teenager, Honey, mother has raised you different. And you see back down through the life what's done for mother. Don't do that. And turn arrogant and say, Take your religion and go. I'll do what I want to. What's the outcome of that teenager? What happens to them? It's gone. They're lost spiritually, morally, many times physically and mentally. They are completely cut off from mercy. 
Well, then, that would be a horrible thing for a teenage boy or girl. Then think about a man or a woman down in the ministry or a Christian that calls himself a child of God and look into the commandments of God and turn their back and say, my denomination don't believe it that way. We need influential Christians influenced by the Word of God. Call men or women for an, for an influence to the elected church for the last days. That's what we need. God give it to us. And they'll be there. They're going to be. We find out that Uzziah, because of his arrogance, he was smitten with leprosy. He never did recover. He never recovered. He had to separate himself from the presence of God and die in a leper's house. Oh, that line, demarcation, that line where men and women can so easily cross, that line that a teenage boy or girl can cross between judgment and mercy. All of us, the line that the businessman can cross. Any of us can cross it between right and wrong. And remember, God's Word is always the thing that's right. Let every man's word be a lie, but mine be the truth, said God. Now, he was smitten. And when young Isaiah saw this, what a lesson that was to him then. To see that a man that gets out of his place, young or old, the one that gets out of his place must suffer the results. No matter how much God had blessed him, he still suffered the results. Now, Isaiah learned by this a great lesson, what? That God orders his man to his place. Man cannot order yourself to a place. God must order your place. Don't forget that. God orders you to your place. And he must not never try to take another's place. Don't try to be something that you're not. This Congressman Upshaw once said, the one that was healed in the meeting, uh, the Lord let me see a vision over in there in California, had been a cripple for 66 years. And was healed instantly by the mercies of God, threw away his crutches and his old chair and things. He's right here in Shreveport, I think, and testifying. He used to have this saying he was a senator, I believe, or something for many years, and congressman from Georgia, and he was a representative of the Baptist Church, the Southern Baptist Council, and then, uh, and then he went and was uh, run for president uh, on the dry ticket and was defeated because of his position. And that night, never even hearing of the man, never, Dr. Roy Davis, the one that laid hands upon me for ordination for the Missionary Baptist Church, he sent him to me. And when he come into the meeting, the Holy Spirit there with thousands of people said he called him by name and told him what he was and told him that the Lord had healed him. And he come to the platform without crutches, without braces, without anything, reached out at the age of about 70-something years old and touched his toes back and forth, completely delivered. And an auditor he was, and a great man he was. What did he, here was his expression, you can't be something that you hate. <laughs> that sounds like me saying that, not a congressman. But uh, uh, that was uh, just, he was a southerner and he kind of used his expression because he was a, a man that tried and he was a great influence to the people and a godly man and died the same way many years later. When he stood on the White House steps at Billy Graham's meeting and sang, leaning on the everlasting arm before uh, people from all over the world. Now, see, the God orders this man, and you can't take another one's place. If you do, you're only producing a carnal impersonation. And finally, it's going to be smitten. You can't do it. God orders you to your place. Isaiah, seeing this, that he could not put his trust in any man. There was the greatest man there was on the earth at that time, a king that had the rest of the world paying tribute to him. But because he got out of his place, 
Isaiah seen that and he could not trust in an arm of flesh. And it drove the prophet to the temple to pray. Oh, God. If the church, if the people that calls themselves Christians could only see this today and would drive them to the altar somewhere to pray, you can't be something that you're not. Then we find at the, in the temple, when he was in prayer, being a prophet, his makeup was to see visions. He was born that way, of course, being a prophet. And he needed a touch from God, and God had ordained him to, to be a prophet. And the vision at the temple, he saw a real king in the vision. He seen God lifted up high above all the heavens. And his great trail filled the earth and the heavens and the skies. He saw a real example. In other words, God said, look up this way. I am your example. And if we can only do that in our own ministry, I'm addressing the ministers and businessmen, teenage the ministers, if we could only do that, I'd like to be a Billy Graham. I wish I had the education and the know-how to, to put the thing together as Billy Graham has. But I cannot be Billy Graham. But Billy Graham can't be me either, see? We each one have our place in Christ. And to try to impersonate Billy Graham would be only the same thing that Uzziah did. It only result in the same way of a disaster. Just be what you are, what God made you to be. Now, Isaiah was a prophet, so he goes down to the temple and he saw the real example. God, note the heavenly seraphims as they flew through the temple. Now, a seraphim is a is a mighty word there. It's not an angel, but it's a... What it is, it's a sacrifice burner. It's, it has something to do with the atonement because he offers the sacrifice to make a way for the repented sinner to the throne of mercy. What a position. Higher than an angel. Greater than an angel. For the angels stand back. But the seraphim goes forward with the offering right in the presence of God. A burner of the, the, the offer of the prayer that's been made. The burner of the sacrifice. And here they was going through the temple crying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Think of it. In the temple before this young prophet, his heart was broke. His king had tried to fill his place, had tried to take a minister's place, and had been totally defeated by God and stricken in leprosy. And, the, and his example, he looked upon man. Don't never trust in some man. I don't care who he is. If he's a holy man, if he's a good... There's no such a thing. Let me correct that. There's no holy man. Amen. There's no holy church. Amen. There is not such a thing. It's a holy God. Amen. Not a holy man. It's a holy ghost. Amen. Peter one time referred the holy mount. On Mount Transfiguration, it wasn't the mountain that was holy. It was a holy God that met him on this mountain. Amen. It's not the Holy Church, it's the Holy God in that church. Not the Holy Man, but the Holy Spirit working in that man. The man will fail. He's a failure to begin with anybody. The very greatest of man fall. Don't never put your confidence on your... To make some man your example. Look to God. Christ is your example. And we find that he had taken his mind now from uh, Uzziah, the king that he loved so well. And he looked up and he saw what he must understand, that to be a prophet, that God and God alone rules in the lives of man, and in his church. And we notice him now what happened. We find these seraphims, they had six wings. 
two over their face and two over their feet and two they were flying with, going through the temple, crying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. They cried day and night because they're in the presence of God. See what God was saying Isaiah to see? The holiness, the purity of God and the reverence that we should re, uh, uh, do in His presence. Let's check this vision just a few moments before we close. Each of these creatures having six wings. We notice we're going to take these wings first. With two, He covered His face. Why did He do that? Think of it. Even holy seraphims in the presence of God have to cover their holy faces to stand in His presence. That never knowed sin. Never did sin. Don't, there's no way for them to sin. But yet in the presence of God, cover their holy faces. And then we, mortal, sinful, corruptible man, will try to in, put something in and add to his word and to his purpose and pass judgment upon some of them who are trying to follow what the Lord said do. No respects of his word. I know the word says that, but he must be born again. But I tell you what I think. But you've got no thought coming. God has spoken. And that settles it. Peter said on the day of Pentecost, the promise is to you, to your children, and to them it's far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. What was the promise of what? The Holy Spirit that was poured out. What startled the people? Because they heard them speaking in languages. that they knew not. And they were staggered like drunk men under the influence of the Holy Spirit. And they was mocking, making fun. And Peter said, the promise isn't to you when they wanted to repent. And to them as far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. How many? As many as the Lord our God shall ever call. Now the church might call you. Your conscience might call you. But when God calls you, He knows how to address His servant. Sinful men, scholarly, educated, influential in their denominations, stand in your garb of denomination and try to inject something with that pure and adulterated word. Remember the word is God. And if a seraphim that know no sin had to cover his face to stand in the presence of God, how are we going to appear that day? When we stand in the presence of his word, preached and thoroughly vindicated by the Holy Ghost, Amen. and still walk away and say it's a telepathy or something like that. What happened to this king, a great man, a believer, a God-blessed man? He was smitten with leprosy, which is a type of sin, unbelief. No cure for it, only Christ. And he died in that same shape. Now, the people doesn't have reverence for him. Why is it that people don't reverence God? Reverence only pertains to God. Spoke of twice in the entire Bible. Both times pertaining to God. Notice, the reason they don't do it is because they're not fully convinced that it is God. They're not fully convinced. Neither was Uzziah. He wasn't fully convinced that God kept every word. Because God had blessed him, he thought, that satisfies me. If I got a blessing from God, I can do what I want to. You can't do it. You cannot do it. You teenager can't do it. 
No matter how much popularity you are, what a fine girl, a fine boy, nice dancer, how the school all appreciates you, you, you won your scholarship, that's all fine. There's nothing against that. That's fine. But don't think you can trample on God's Word and get by with it. Amen. Don't you ministers think you can do it and get by with it. None of us is going to do it. Amen. You housewives. Are you businessmen? We're all going to answer to God by His Word. Isaiah was learning this. They're not conscious of His presence. How would pay us today to listen to what David said? He said, The Lord is always before me. He bound His commandments up on the doorpost and, and up on His bedpost. And he, he put them up everywhere. He even bound them in His heart. Purposed in His heart that He wouldn't sin against God. He stayed constantly with the Word before Him. That's the reason he said, I shall not be moved. Because everything he done, he had the Word before him. And that's what we should always do, the order of God. Now, he covered his face because God's all holy. And he was crying, holy, holy, holy. Now, let's take secondarily. He had two covers of wings over his feet. What did that mean? Humility in his presence. That's the hard thing for a man that's got a position. That's a hard thing for the teenage girl that's pretty. That's a hard thing for the teenage boy that's popular in school. A star in basketball. Oh, young fella, how God could, could use you if you just let him do it. Young girl, you and your fine, pretty little queenish looks that God gave you, why don't you use that influence to the kingdom of God, to what God gave it to you for, that virtue of womanhood? Use it that way. You're bound to come out right then. But any other way, you've got to fail. You're, you're be a total failure. God made you and nobody else can take your place. Nobody can fill that place. You must be that way. Now, humbled in His presence. These seraphims humbled in His presence. Like Moses. When Moses was a great intellectual man, we understand that he could teach the Egyptians wisdom. Science and the great wisdom uh, of Egypt, we have never competed with it yet in our science. We don't build pyramids, you know, nowadays. <laughs> we couldn't replace one like it is in the center of the earth, where no matter where the sun is, there's not a shadow around it. And we could not build the Sphinx or many of those things, and neither could we make a mummy today that would make him look natural after thousands of years. Just a few hours is all we can keep a corpse out. They had a fluid then they could embalm with that we don't know nothing about. A color that it never you loses its color. Many of the arts that they had in science that we don't have it. And listen, young people. You're living in a college town here or a town where I live in a university town. And the, the science is all right as long as it's not getting out of the Word of God. But I want to know, science cannot give you life. Science can tell you how that the... And, and another thing, science has to always take back usually what they say to be scientifically proved. You know, I just seen the other day a, a professor of science speaking that now that they have proved that these bones that they dig up, it says 100 million years old. Two years ago, they found out that it's the uh, salt water that the bone laid in. There's nothing, nowhere in science or anything can say the world's over 6,000 years old. The chloride and stuff in the water has deteriorated the bone in that manner, which would put a, make it look like it was a million years old. But it isn't. But you think they'll advertise that? No, sir. They won't take back what they said. But here's the Bible, my brother, sister, my young teenage brother or sister, that God never has to take back what he said because it's the truth, always the truth. It's always right. When God said anything, that means it. I was speaking recently at a meeting, and a fellow said, met me on the outside. He said, you're, you're barking up the wrong tree, fellow. said, you said that the world here, the 6,000 years old, I said, the order of the world is right. 6,000 years. He said, look, he said, the Bible said that, that God created the heavens and earth in six days. I said, he did not do that. Genesis 1, he said, in the beginning, God created the heavens and earth, period. Amen. How long he done it, I don't know. Nobody else does God did that. That's period. That's the end of the sentence. And when he began to use it, the world was out for him and void and water was up on the deep and the Spirit of God moved up on the water. 
But in Genesis 1 said, God created the heavens and earth in the beginning. That's all. Don't fuss about it. I just believe it. That's all. God created it. It's not my business to know. I'm glad he did it. Let me live here for a while. He's got a new one. For him dwelleth righteousness. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood with righteousness. No creed denomination, no man's example. I want Christ and him alone. That's what we must have. Humble. Moses, an intellectual man. But in the presence of that burning bush, he took off his shoes. He was on holy ground. Humbled himself. Humility. That's what the covering of the feet was. Humility. Look at Paul, the great intellectual scholar taught under Gamaliel, one of the greatest Hebrew teachers of his day. Smart, intellectual, college degree. And he thought he knowed it all. And these bunch of people that was carrying on were nothing but uh, mad people. Crazy. And he had orders from his high priest to go down and, and rest them all down in Damascus. And one day on the road down... He come into the presence of that same one that spoke to Moses in the burning bush, a pillar of fire. Amen. What did Paul do? Saul, rather, he fell upon his face in humility, off of his feet onto his face in humility. What did John the Baptist do? The man that Jesus said there was never a man born of a woman like him or could compare with him until that time. That great prophet ordained of God before the foundation of the world spoke of 1,207 years before he ever come on, or 712 years, rather, before he came to the earth for the prophet Isaiah here. What did he do when he seen a man come walking down out of the audience? And he looked up above and saw that fire coming down from heaven in the form of a dove. He cried out, I have need to be baptized of thee. I must decrease, he must increase. God can't have two on the earth at the same time. Only one has the message, you know. I must decrease. He is the messenger. I've been up to this time now. He takes my place. As Elisha, when Elijah went up and threw back his robe to Elisha, his ministry is finished. Elisha must take up where he left off. He must increase. I must decrease. John the Baptist. Be conscious of your littleness. You're nothing. You're nothing. How I'd like to dwell on that a few minutes. But you're nothing. Let me, this sounds sacrilegious and it sounds crude. And I don't think the pulpit is any place for any minister to crack jokes. It's, it's become a joking, a carry-on Hollywood glamour now. That's what's the matter. Hollywood through television has tucked the pulpit over. Our women has bowed to the goddess of fashion of Hollywood long ago. And then the pulpit got into Hollywood through singers and so forth, talented men. Oh, how a shrewd man that devil is. You can't mix oil and water. It won't mix. Notice the great influence that people can give to others and what you do is an influence. If you want to find how great you are, put your finger down at a pool of water or a bucket of water. Then pull your finger out and try to find where you put your finger. You're nothing. God can do without you. He can do without me. But we can't do without Him. We've got to have Him for He is life and He alone. Not to know his book, not to know this or know that or know the creed, but to know him is life. Amen. Know him as the person, Christ in you, the word made flesh in you. Amen. That's knowing him. When he, you and he became, becomes one, like I said last night in the super sign, he's got to come in you. You, God and man must become one. You're conscious of your littleness. Now... In closing, I might use the other uh, two wings. Thirdly, he could fly with these other two wings. Watch. Face covered by the holiness of God and in reverence, his feet covered in humility. And with two wings, he could put himself in action to move. God was showing his prophet 
how a prepared servant ought to be. Quit looking at Uzziah. Here is your example I sent before you. Cover your face in reverence. Cover your feet in humility and go into action. Oh, what an example. He had looked at Uzziah so long and seen it fail. Now God's telling him what to do, showing him a prepared servant. He went into action. Like the woman at the well went into action as soon as Jesus told her she had five husbands. That woman had been looking for something like that to happen. 400 years, no profit. And all at once she goes up to get the water one morning unexpectedly. And there she met something real. God will place him before us somewhere, sometimes unexpectedly. I hope he does it this morning. He did it to her when she didn't expect it. And when he told her, a woman bring me a drink, and she discussed with him about the water, and he had nothing to draw with, and he let her know that he had water, that she wouldn't come there to draw. And then they went talking about where, what the religious rites was. Said, our fathers worshiped in this mountain, you said, Jerusalem. And Jesus, after a while, what was he? He was the Word. St. John 1. In the beginning was the Word, the Word is with God, and the Word was God. Hebrews, the fourth chapter, said the Word of God is quicker, more powerful than a two-edged sword. Cutting, it just don't baby and pat, it cuts. Amen. Coming and going. See? Cutting to the mire of the bone, and it is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. That's the Word. The Word made flesh. And here it was, what did he do? He looked upon them and could perceive their thoughts because he was that word. Amen. And the unchangeable word. And he's still the same. He doesn't change. Now notice, in this unchangeable word, he looked right into the woman's face. And here she was standing, as we'd call her today, a woman of ill fame, a street prostitute or something. Maybe a child had been turned out and let go by parents and too many of them today. But here was this lovely, pretty, young, maybe teenage woman. Maybe in her 18 years, she should be out of high school. And here she had tucked the robe that's wrong, and the morals of her life was decayed, and she had nothing she could hold on to. Yet a, a pretty girl. And she goes up to get some water, and she runs into a man there that spoke to her, and she said, There's a segregation here. You shouldn't speak to me. You're a Hebrew. And I'm a woman of Samaria. And after all, look who I am. Why do you speak to me? What do you want? See, her, 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 her motive was wrong. And many times, what if that woman had thrown down the water pot and walked away? Like some people get up and walk out of a meeting before they don't see it had never been that way. But there was something another to that predestinated seed that there was something interesting in this person. So she talked to him. What happened? He told her the things that she had done. And when he did that, told her these things, she said, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Amen. You don't know me. Amen. Why did she know he was a prophet? Because the word had come to him. The Bible said, If there be one among you spiritual or a prophet, I, the Lord, will make myself known to him. Amen. And if what he says is the truth, then hear him. Amen. For he is my representative. He is my word manifested. And she said, Sir, otherwise we haven't had a prophet for 400 years. And I perceive that you are a prophet. Now, we have no scripture saying that we're to get a prophet now outside of the Messiah. We know Messiah's coming. And this was, that's a sign of a prophet. We know he's coming and he'll do these things. And Jesus then, the great sufficiency came. He said, I am he. Hey, man. What? Immediately. Not jump up and run away. I ain't going to listen to it. She covered her face. I admit I'm wrong. Humbly, she asked, give me this water, Lord, that I come here not to draw. See that see the, her, her, the way God dresses his people? Now what? She's ready. Then it's revealed to her that that is Messiah. And immediately she went into action. Stop her. You couldn't do it. 
right into the city and said, Come see a man who's told me the things I've done. We've been looking for the Messiah, and there he is. And the Bible says that the man of that city believed because of the woman's testimony. She had something so real that she could display. Her influence after meeting Jesus Christ and bringing back the direct results that her Bible, as she had been taught, told her that the Messiah would do. She convinced the man that that was the Messiah. 400 years and never had nothing like it. Here is the man. And her testimony, yet a prostitute, was convincing. Oh, young lady, you might not live that kind of a life. But oh, if you can only meet this one I'm talking about. What's your influence to be to your schoolmates? Young man, like Saul, educated, smart. What an influence he was to the whole Christian world. He was sent as an apostle to the Gentiles. When he met this Jesus in the pillar of fire, that day knowing that was the same God that brought his people out of Israel, out of Egypt, Israel out of Egypt. You can meet this same God. That's the Bible. Manifested, proving that he is God. The vindication of him right on earth now that his word is made known for he's the same yesterday and forever. What an influence you'll be to your church, to your community, to the entire, everybody you come in contact with, you'll be a changed person. Yes. Yes, sir. And Peter, when he seen and was convinced that we find out he'd fished all night and had taken nothing. He was a fisherman. He knew when the moon changed and when fish run and when they didn't. But he was kind enough to sit down and listen to Jesus for a few minutes. He didn't get up and run out. He stood to hear it through. And after the message is all over and everything, because he was kind enough, he fished all night and got nothing. How many Simons is there in here this morning? How many will listen to this tape? Simons. You jump from Methodist to Baptist to Pentecostal to oneness to twoness to threeness to everything and still got nothing. Why don't you sit down and listen just a minute? Just loan a few minutes of your time to Christ. Watch the word come. Simon? Now he's commissioning. Let down the net for the draw. And when he got a hold to the fish, he said, Lord, I've sained all night. It's beyond my intelligence. I can't explain how, neither can I explain how it works. I don't know the mechanics, just the dynamics is all I'm interested in. I don't know how he does it, but he does it because he promised it. He let down the net because he knew if there was no fish in there and God said there would be fish in there, he let down the net anyhow. You say, I've been to the altar, I've did this, I've done that, I've tried, I've been up and down. I let down the net. That's the commandment. And when he caught the fishes, what did he do? First, he fell upon his knees in reverence and respect. And he cried out, depart from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. What is it? Reverence, humility. What was the word come back? Fear not, Simon. From henceforth you will be a fisherman of man. In action. And he died in action. Oh, my. The blind man was healed. He couldn't explain. He couldn't tell just how it was that he did it. And he didn't know whether he was a sinner or not. He says, it's a strange thing to me that you man here, you priest, asked me what this question. They said, who healed you? They asked his father and mother, but they said, the already priest had told him, if anybody tended Jesus' meetings, he's an he's a, he's a insane man. If you tend his meetings, you're excommunicated from this church. We'll put you, that's what the Bible said. We'll put you right out of church if you attend that meeting. But the blind man, see the meeting come to him. And Jesus healed him. And then even his parents, afraid of losing their dignity of being the member of this great church of the city, they was ashamed to say anything about it. They turned it back on to the boy. And they said, um, uh, ask him, he's of age. Go ask him how it happened. We know that's her son and we know he's born blind. But I, I ain't going to say nothing. Oh, that lukewarm, borderline make-believer. But this man who had his eyes healed, they said, Who heals you? He said, One called Jesus of Nazareth. Amen. Yes, sir. He sat in humility. The work was done. They said, That man's a sinner. 
We don't know. We have no school he ever come out of. He don't belong to any organizations. He has no fellowship cards. We have nothing to do with him. We know he's a sinner. Well, they said, now that's a strange thing. Said a man that could open my eyes, which has never been done since the world began. A man, a minister, opens my eyes, which has never been done in the world. And you clergymen who are supposed to know all the ins and outs of the word, and you don't know nothing about him? That's a strange thing. When the very Bible said that when he come, the blind should see, the lame men and leap like a heart, they ought to see the word was manifested. See, but the boy knew he had been there. What did he do? He was in action. He was ready before his boss. He was ready before the priest. He was ready before the council. He was ready for anything because he had recognized God and humbled himself and went into action with his testimony. That's a real servant. The pillar of fire ought to put us in action today. As we've seen it vindicated in the words of his promise for this hour, this last day, it should put the whole move of God into action. But the trouble is, our organization says, now, wait a minute. That didn't come through our group. That's Jesus' name. That's a, that's a renegade. That's a Baptist. That's a, see, uh, see, see, they just don't see it. That's right. Sign. Oh, the sign of his coming is at hand. And we know there's not a thing on earth. Science tells us it's three minutes till midnight. Told us that several years ago. Then we must be just about maybe a moment from midnight. We don't know what time the, the powder is going to light in the keg. Look at this election coming up here tomorrow. That's all it would take is light one. When that radar screen picks up that atomic bomb, every one of them is going to turn loose. But the church will be gone before that time. So if that could happen any minute and the church has to go before that happens, how far is it off? And the very things that he said would happen is ministry. And what would take place in the last days, we watch it night after night and day after day. Saying the time is at hand. Oh, we are to humble ourselves and get hum in humility and get into action. That's right. Word fulfilled should put us all in action. We, like the prophet Isaiah, has seen the outcome of self-exalted people who says... Well, now, if it's going to be any worse, it's going to be in our denomination. If it comes to the Trinity, all right. Or if it comes to the oneness, all right. Or if it comes to the Church of God, the Methodist, the Baptist, the Catholic, or the Press, it's all right. I was interviewed here in Mexico. Brother Jack was with me, and the little baby was raised from the dead after dying that morning at 9 o'clock, and was raised up from the dead that night at 11 on the platform by a vision. Brother Jack was there, standing to pray for the baby. The lady holding a baby in her arms like this, raining and pouring down, and he had on Brother Romance's coat. And I, Billy said, I'll give out bro, uh, this Brother Espinosa's friend. I don't know what, I called him Amania because he, he, he was so, so slow. And so I said, uh, he give out the prayer cards, and Billy just stood to see it. he didn't sell one. And he give them all out, and this woman had a dead baby. And she said, well, Billy said, I ain't got enough ushers to hold her back. And I said, she'd never know me. She don't know me. The night before, that blind man had received his sight. And as far as across this platform, this ricks of old sh coats and shawls and things, poor people. And I said, well, Brother Jack, go down and pray for the baby. I said, she never know the difference between me and you. And she just run around that man's legs and jump up on top of their backs and walk with that dead baby. A little, pretty little girl, just about this high, maybe her first baby. And she looked to be in her 20s. Very attractive girl. And so um, I said, go pray for her, Brother Jack, because she'll never know who's who. And me standing back there speaking through an interpreter, she wouldn't know whether I was one praying for the sick or he was. Brother Jack started down there, and I looked out in front of me, and there was a vision, this little baby sitting here. I said, never mind, bring it here. In a few moments, that baby was alive, laying hands upon it. She went into action right quick. To her doctor with a statement signed. A baby died in his office that morning with pneumonia. And 11 o'clock that night, he was back to life again because she was persistent. She had to press in. There was something real. If a blind man could receive his sight, her baby could be raised from the dead. I like that. God give us more people like that. And her, a Catholic, coming up with her beads in her hands, I told her that wasn't necessary. No disregard to that young fellow. No disregard to that. But I, that ain't necessary. It's God we believe in. Not any form, not a Methodist prayer or a Presbyterian prayer or a Pentecostal shout. It's God we believe in. 
not a Catholic bead or whatever more. We believe in God, the living God, by His Word, and His Word is God. And it's bound to produce because it's a seed. Now, the prophet then seen what self-exalted denominations did. He seen they could not take the place of the office. They lose their hope with their creeds and so forth. In expectancy of the creeds, they accept that and think that's it. And we find out that man, like Uzziah, tried to take the place of the anointed office, and they fail. Many of them turns out neurotics, drunkards, and so forth. Trying to take the place of an anointed office, trying to impersonate. Instead of having what they're talking about, and called of God to do it, and ordained of God to do it, they run off in great big swarms and build big organizations and intellectual man and great big things and flashing and like Hollywood and preaching the coming of the Lord is at hand. We've seen man lose their hope because they try to take an office they're not ordained to, just like Uzziah. We've seen the churches proselyte. We've seen in our Pentecostal assemblies, every one that's trying to get the Trinity over, the Trinity trying to get the oneness over, the Church of God trying to get this over, and all these others trying to get one another. Proselyting, impersonating, trying to do something they're not called to do. God said, preach the gospel. Demonstrate the power of the Holy Ghost. These signs will follow them that believe. Not go make organizations, have schools and so forth. Nothing against it. But that don't take this office's place. And we see now that men and women who try to take that anointed office when they're not ordained to do it, we see what happens to them. There's your example. Ministers. We see it in the teenage life. We see it everywhere. That's, don't watch man. Watch God. Take your eyes from man. Put it on God. Not influence. Say, oh, glory to God. The Lord tells me, thus saith the Lord, do so and so. And it never happens. See, you're trying to impersonate something that you know nothing about. Don't do that. It's dangerous. You'll be stricken with spiritual leprosy. Unbelief. The denominations trying to build up, get a feather, and you have to be a presbyter. If a day be like David, I'd rather be a doormat at the house of my God than to dwell in the tents with the wicked. Yes, a doormat. Wherever you call me, Lord, let me be the best doormat you ever had. If the people have to wipe their feet on me, let me be a real doormat. I'll clean feet if nothing else. That's what Jesus did. When he come to the earth, he become God's doormat. Amen. His own son. Who are you, bishop? State presbyter. Amen. When Jesus become a foot washed flunky, a doormat at the house of the Lord. Amen. Oh, my. And then we think we're somebody because we got a doctor's degree. We went through college. Look at your example, what he did. Don't look to what the bishop before you, the presbyter before you, whatever like that. He might have been a good man. That doesn't matter. It's you. Look at God. When he's seen the effects, that seen what's taking place, now I'm closing. One more thing. I say, his feet, hands, his wings covered his face in reverence, his feet in humility, and then his two wings put him in action. Just think of that. The effects of the vision upon the prophet. What did it do to the prophet? It showed him that no man... No man, don't put your confidence in a man. When that man leaves the word of God, you leave the man. Amen. Huh? You leave the man. Amen. Stay with God. God is the word. Amen. Watch what the, the effects did. Now, minister brothers, I want this to go down in your hearts. All of you. What happened to the prophet? It caused that prophet ordained to an office before the foundation of the world. Gifts and callings are without repentance. It caused that prophet. What about a minister? Bishop. Which is nothing like a prophet. Amen. Teacher, pastor, or evangelist. What do I do to them? But to see the vision of the Lord, it caused the prophet to confess he was a sinner. Amen. He didn't walk out and say, yes, glory to God. Hallelujah. That's good enough for me. Praise God. I'm going out. 
Or he didn't go up and say, I'll not listen to that. I had a mental illusion. It is according to what the priest says. No. He took lesson to it. He saw what God was trying to show him. Why? The spiritual seed was already in him. Like it was in the woman at the well. Like it was the others. They were ordained, foreordained to this. And he saw the reason. He saw Uzziah in the leper house. A great man who tried to impersonate something. He saw God sitting there and he saw how God dressed his servants and how he sent them out. Caused him to say, I am a sinner. Then he come the time for the cleansing. After the confession. I am a sinner. The prophet. A man who had been in the king's palace known to be a prophet. Do you hear me? Cause this ordained prophet, the vision of the Lord, caused him to cry out, Woe is me! I'm a man of unclean lips. I live among un uh, people that's got unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the order of the Lord. Oh, minister, brother, can you sit? My eyes have seen the order of the Lord. Then come the cleansing. Here come the cherubim with a coal of fire off the altar. That he took with his tongs, the tongs from the altar, put it in his hands, and took back Isaiah's head because he was ready to confess. And confess that he was unclean. Because he looked to some bishop or somebody for his example instead of looking towards God. Instead of looking towards the Word, you look towards a creed. Still put you back a man of unclean lips. And the angel come with fire, placed it upon his lips and said, Now you're clean. Notice the order. He never brought him a book, a catechism. God doesn't prepare his servants by books and catechism. He prepares his servants by fire. Amen. Cleansing fire. Amen. Fire from the altar. And he cried when he cried out and said, Woe is me, for I've done wrong. I put my example and my trust in a man, and I see the order of the Lord. And he cleansed him with the coal of fire. Now, isn't it wonderful how the man recognized himself being a sinner? And look how God did as soon as he recognized he was a sinner. He confessed to being a sinner. Confessed to his wrong. And he saw what God did and how he did it. How he cleaned him by a coal of fire. Not a declaration of creeds. Not a, a bunch of beads. Not some historical affair. He cleansed him with present tense Amen. living fire. Amen. And the Bible said that the promises unto you and to your children and them as far off even as the many as the Lord our God shall call. This same Holy Ghost, this same Jesus that come in the form of the Holy Ghost on the day of Pentecost is the only cleansing process God knows anything about cleansing His servant. He's seen the order. He's seen what God's servant prepared, how he was to act. He's seen the way God got His servant ready. How He set Him in order. Notice. Then the following, after the cleansing, after the commission, after He did this, Followed then what? The commission. After confession and cleansed, it was then that the clean Isaiah answered when the Lord said, Who will go? He said, Here am I. Send me. Young man, woman, your life before you. Let you and I go down to the altar this morning. Let's go out to the house of God for a few minutes. Businessman, housewife. Minister, let's go down to the house of God. There's something wrong somewhere. You've had too much more, so much carnal impersonation in the world of Christianity. Young folks, I feel sorry for you. You don't know which way to turn. One says this and one says that and one says it's a hail Mary and the other says it's something else and one says join this church and join that. It's all wrong. For God has thoroughly showed that the thing is dead. Now let's go down to the house of God in our heart, the altar. Let's look up and see what Jesus looks like, which is the Word. And then...
we can answer, Here am I, send me, Lord. Send me to the house to be a better wife. Send me to school to be a better teenage girl. Send me to school to be a better teenage boy. Send me to the pulpit, a different minister. Send me to my business, a different businessman. When you see your example, Jesus Christ. He said, here am I. Send me after his humility, after he's seen the order, how God puts his servant together, how he commissions him. Before he commissions him, he has to be humble, reverent, and in action. And therefore, when he's seen that, the cleansed Isaiah said, Here am I. Send me. Let us bow our heads just a moment. Right. of God said who'll go far up? then he answered master here send me speak my Lord speak my Lord speak and I'll be quick to answer thee speak my Think of it now, teenager, while they're humming that song. Think of it, minister, businessman, housewife. We're down at the house of the Lord now. Look above you and see your example, the cherubims. Just think, you're at the end of time now. Time will fade into eternity, maybe today. We don't know just when. Think of it. There's millions now in sin and shame are dying. Look on the streets. Listen to their sad and bitter cry. Hasten, brother, hasten to their rescue. Quickly answer, Master, here am I. Oh, speak, my Oh, speak. Mean it from your heart now. Isaiah, where are you? And I'll be quick to answer thee. Speak, my Lord. Methodist, Baptist, Pentecostals, where are you at? Lord, speak and I will answer. Lord. Well, he speaks to your heart. Will you mean it? Speak, my Lord. Oh, speak, my Lord. If he's speaking to you while they're singing, will quickly end. Will you raise up your hand and say, Me, Lord. Me, Lord. God bless you. My Lord. Speak, my Lord. Speak, and I. Let me be in 
influence, Lord, to others. I can't do it to you. Cleanse me. Send the angel now, Lord. Speak, my Lord. Oh, speak, my Lord. Speak, and I will answer, answer thee. Oh, speak, my Lord. Speak, my Lord. With your hands up now. Can I? It shows he's speaking. Now may the fire come and cleanse it. Mm, my Lord, speak, my Lord. Lord Jesus, as the song is saying, speak, and I will quickly answer thee. Literally dozens of hands are up in here, Lord, amongst the teenage and amongst the old ministers. Businessman, surely, Lord, you're still speaking. Send the angel now with a coal of cleansing fire. Prepare your servants right, Lord, for the task it lays before us. Isaiah knew to be a prophet, it taken more than what he had to meet the answer of the day. And so does it take more than we've got, Lord, today to meet the answer. It takes the person of Christ within us. It takes Jesus himself to answer the question. Grant, Lord, grant that the Holy Ghost and the person of Christ, or Christ and the person of the Holy Ghost, may come into every heart just now. Cleanse us, Lord, from our unbelief. Cleanse us from our uh, creeds and our foolishness of this world. Cleanse us from it, Lord, and put your word in our heart. And meditate on it day and night. May the answer come, Lord, as soon as our hearts are cleansed. Grant it, Lord. May the angel of God touch each one of our hearts now with that coal of fire as we're waiting upon him. Grant it, Lord. Now with your heads and your arms, your heart, your everything turned to God, right here in the temple of God where the Holy Ghost is and his train fills the building. The presence of his being is here. Let's just accept it now. If you can feel God touching you now as we sing this song again. When the coal of fire had touched the prophet, making him as pure as pure could be. Let's as our heads and hearts bowed before him now. Sing that again. And let's, let the angel of God cleanse our hearts from all filth and and all the glamour of the world. And you little girls and boys from high school and your little teenagers of Shreveport here, you good old southern people here that used to have the old-fashioned gospel down here, you see there's something that the church don't provide for you today, but God's got it for you. Won't you let him cleanse your heart now? You dwell among people that dance and everything else and call themselves church members. And you see the filth and things that's in our churches from everywhere, from Catholic, from the first organized church to the last one, that's Pentecost. Every one of us is guilty. Every one are guilty without any exceptions. You see where we've got ourselves, our great schools to educate our ministers and things and the thing that they twisted us up in out there. Let's throw the thing aside. Do like Paul of old. None of these things move me. I'm persuaded that there's nothing present or nothing future. Nothing can separate us from that love of God that's in Christ. And forgetting those things that are in the past, I press towards the mark of the high calling in Christ. Oh, my, believe it now as we close our eyes and open our hearts to him and say, When the coal of fire had touched the prophet, making him as pure as pure can be, when the voice of God said, Who'll go for us? Then he answered, Master, here send me. Oh, speak, my Lord, speak. Now let's just raise our hands to him and believe it. Speak, speak, Lord. I'll be quick to answer thee. Speak, my Lord, speak.
pray now. I want to ask Brother Don to come here and pray with us. Speak, and I'll be quick to let 